Good morning and good evening to all of you. Let me uh, welcome you to our program on expanding the US India Business Corridor and addressing the conversations on gender inclusion and gender diversity. Uh, let me begin by thanking Consul General uh, David Rance, the US Consul General in Mumbai, um, for collaborating with us uh, at the US India Business Council in putting together this important discussion on promoting gender diversity at work. You know, the COVID-19 pandemic was a crisis of historic proportions with major impact on the lives and livelihoods of people around the world. The pandemic also provided a one, two, three punch for many working women. The industries that were hit hardest and earliest by job losses were ones where women dominate. Hospitality, education, retail, and healthcare. In the corporate sector, globally, 30% of C-suite or VP level women reported that the pandemic had altered the course of their career and about 25% have indicated that they may leave their posts sooner than expected due to the pandemic and their company's response to the pandemic. Many women who have kept their jobs have also faced a daunting task attempting to balance childcare, teaching, and family caregiving roles. Yet even after the immediate health crisis abates, many women who found their careers derailed will face significant challenges as we look at the new normal that has exacerbated some long-standing gender disparities. The economic hit to both the US and Indian economies and the global economy as a whole will mean that we all need the economic growth, dynamism, and ingenuity that we can find in the years ahead. Thankfully, a key part of that solution is staring us right in the face, and that is unleashing the economic power of women, bringing the world's largest excluded group fully into the fold. With this in mind, I look forward to a really fantastic conversation today on the barriers to women in the workplace, on how the business community and the government can work in tandem to reduce and eventually eliminate those barriers, and also touch upon the economic policies, laws, and institutions that business um, and business culture that can be addressed to empower women and, and create the necessary climate to really achieve their full potential. This is a timely discussion given that the Biden administration is very focused on jumpstarting the US economy and bringing women back into the workforce. Prime Minister Modi has also been a longtime advocate of policies that uh, focus on women and helping achieve their full potential. We may see more of that in the union budget, which will be coming out next week. And before I turn it over to and introduce uh, Consul General Rance, let me just quickly introduce um, and welcome our panelists as well. Uh, we have joining us today Kiran Mazumdar Shah, Vice Chair of the U.S. India Business Council Board of Directors and the Chair uh, and Founder of Biocon. She's a pioneer in biotechnology and Kiran's commitment to innovation, affordable health care um, has made her a name to reckon with. Kiran, as USIBC continues to work on that front, I'm sure the life sciences and healthcare sector will become one of the key avenues for collaboration. Ann Cairns, the Global Vice Chair of MasterCard, is joining us as well. In her role as Vice Chairman, Ann represents MasterCard around the world, focusing on inclusion, diversity, innovation, and she has been instrumental in the company's expansion into diverse geographies as well. She's an award-winning research engineer, moving through the ranks to become the head of offshore engineer for British Gas, um, she was also the first woman to be qualified to go offshore in Britain. It'll be uh, fantastic to hear from her today as well. Moderating that conversation will be Dipti Ravula, who is a leader in the women's empowerment space, working with WeHub, um, which is uh, 
um, organization that provides an incubator and support to women-led startups. So we have a, a, a great conversation teed up today. And to kick us off on that, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce David Rance, the Consul General of the United States in Mumbai. He's a career diplomat since 1992 and is a member of the Senior Foreign Service. Um, he, he is a minister counselor who has served as uh, both Deputy Assistant Secretary in the uh, State Department in the Bureau of South and Central Asia, where I had the privilege of getting to know him and work with him. And he's a re recipient of the department's um, Herbert Salzman Award for International Economic Performance. David has a vast and storied career at the department and a great uh, uh, future ahead of him as well, but um, for us, he's been just a stellar partner as the as the Consul General in Mumbai. David, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Nisha. Good evening to all those of you who are joining us from India. Good morning in the United States. Uh, I would like to thank the U.S. India Business Council and you, Nisha, for partnering with us to address what I regard as one of the most important challenges we face today. Uh, I'm honored and, and truly thrilled that we have such an eminent panel of world-renowned experts who have joined us to explore this topic in depth, uh, Deepthi Ravula, Kiran Mazumdar Shah, and Anne Cairns. And finally, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for joining us today. It is my highest hope that frank discussions such as these will translate into concrete action and tangible progress and perhaps inspire the change makers of tomorrow. The message I have for you today is simple. There has been a collective failure in global efforts to empower women to play an equal role in the workforce. Despite the multitude of government and private sector initiatives aimed at ensuring women's access to education, capital, and equal opportunity business environments, we continue to fall short in essentially every way. This is a problem for the United States. It is a problem for India. Indeed, it is a problem faced to some degree by every country in the world. Moreover, this, program, this problem does not affect women only. By stacking the deck against approximately half of the global workforce, we, the community of nations, are standing in the way of our own socioeconomic progress. I want to start by sharing a few facts and figures from the World Bank and the World Economic Forum that illustrate the severity of the problem and how it permeates every facet of our lives. <clears throat> Firstly, the World Economic Forum reports that women's global average annual income stands at just $11,000 in purchasing power parity compared to nearly twice that, 21,000 for men. Projecting current trends into the future, the overall global gender wage gap won't close for 100 years. Think about that. When your great-great-granddaughter graduates in 2121, she might have a shot at entering an equal workforce, maybe. The gender gap is even more profound when it comes to economic participation and opportunity. If we continue along the same trajectory as we witnessed between 2006 and 2020, it will take 257 years to close this gap worldwide. To put that in context, imagine sitting around in 1764 thinking about the good times to come in 2021. Things are just as bad at the highest levels of corporate leadership worldwide, where women account for just 24% of senior roles. Even fewer are CEOs of the world's largest corporations. Just one in 20 Fortune 500 companies was led by a woman in 2018. Although women are gaining representation amongst executive committees in Fortune Global 100 companies, at the board level, they remain a small minority. In 2017, women accounted for 22% of executive committee roles in the Americas, 15% in Europe, and just 4% in Asia. While this is a global phenomenon, the situation is particularly alarming in India. Figures from the World Economic Forum's 2020 Global Gender Gap Index indicate that just 25% of women formally engage in India's labor market, compared with 82% of men. This is one of the lowest workforce participation rates in the world for women, ranking India 145th out of 153 countries. This figure is even more worrisome, given the fact that women's labor force participation rate in India has actually fallen from 35% in 1990 to 25% now, despite significant educational gains and robust GDP growth. India is the only major economy in the world to witness such a negative trend in women's participation in the workforce. 
Among India's senior official, uh, officials and managers, women account for only 14% of leadership roles, putting India at 136th in the WEF's Global Gender Gap Index, and just 30% of professional and technical workers. The government of India has reported that only 10% of startup founders are women, and women fill just 22% of positions in the field of artificial intelligence, despite India having the second largest AI workforce in the world. And for a big picture view, if you look at just the raw numbers before adjusting for the type of work or population or the other tools economists use, if you just break it down and ask, what is the average salary of an Indian woman compared to an Indian man? The answer is an Indian woman is making about 20% of what an Indian man makes. That compares to an average American woman who makes about 65% of an American man, an average Chinese woman making 60% of an average Chinese man, and an average Bangladeshi woman making 40% of an average Bangladeshi man. These numbers are all terrible and alone should serve as a call to action to set things right. But salaries and glass ceilings don't tell the whole story. On top of being underpaid and discriminated against in the workplace, women also face enormous pressure to be both full-time professionals and full-time homemakers. According to the OECD, the average Indian woman performs six hours a day of housework or nearly an entire second unpaid job. The average Indian man, one hour. Or take this data point from Oxfam's Time to Care 2020 report. Women and girls in India contribute 3.26 billion hours of unpaid care work every day, representing the equivalent of at least $271 billion in unpaid income in India a year. This burden of unpaid work negatively impacts women's economic gains and traps them at the bottom of the economy. Now, let's be clear. While addressing our collective failure to empower women in the workplace is a matter of justice and equity, it also makes basic economic sense. No country can reach its full potential while excluding half its workforce from full and equal participation. According to the IMF, reaching gender parity would boost India's GDP by as much as 27%. The World Bank reports that India's GDP growth rate would climb above 9% if women had an equitable share of jobs and that India could boost its growth by 1.5 percentage points per year if just 50% of women could join the workforce. And perhaps counterintuitively, when more women participate in the work labor force, men also benefit. A 2019 IMF study found that as women's complementary skills raise productivity, wages are boosted for everyone. The IMF study echoes an earlier McKinsey Global Institute report, which noted that India could add up to $770 billion to its GDP by 2020 if equal opportunities were given to women. So there's a clear problem and a compelling case based on both justice and equity and simple economics to do something about it. And some work is already being done. The US government has long had programs to promote women's economic empowerment in India and beyond. The 2017 Global Entrepreneurship Summit in Hyderabad, a US-India partnership, resulted in the Women Entrepreneurship Platform, which provides networking, mentorship, and financing information to some 13,000 members. More recently, the US Agency for International Development, or USAID, launched a partnership with MasterCard to co-fund a women's economic empowerment program in India called Project Kirana. The program launched last November to help expand women's access to the digital economy by providing training and digital financial services to women business owners. The initial phase to be implemented in Uttar Pradesh expects to impact 3,000 women with follow-on activity in Lucknow, Kanpur, and Varanasi. And the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, or DFC, recently announced plans to mobilize $6 billion in private investment for global women's economic empowerment, helping to address one of the major challenges for business women in particular, overcoming barriers in access to finance. The Indian government has taken many steps to address women's empowerment as well. For example, India is among the handful of countries that has instituted quotas for women on boards of public companies. India has also instituted quotas at local government councils, enabling many women, women to enter politics for the first time. While these are positive steps, we have to plainly acknowledge that quotas are controversial and not a panacea for parity.
For example, in a 2017 study in Spain, researchers looked at the effect of gender quotas in local elections. While those quotas increased the number of women elected, a positive development, they did not significantly increase the probability of women reaching non-elected leadership positions. So thus far, we have identified the problem, reviewed arguments involving justice, equity, and simple economics for finding a solution, and discussed a few things that are already being done at the national institutional levels. My focus today is on what we, all of us participating in this forum, can as individuals do to advance women's economic empowerment. Since my arrival in Mumbai in 2019, I have challenged members of the business community, including American firms based in India, to be more active, engaged, and creative in their efforts to promote full equality and participation by women in the workforce. I've pressed business community leaders and others to ask, what norms and policies are impeding this shared goal? And I've distilled their feedback into three key areas that will have an impact at both the micro and macro level. First, top management professionals, both men and women, must set a tone that signifies their support for women leaders. It is incumbent on people in positions of authority to lead in a way that lifts others up with a particular attention to women. In the workplace, for example, when top management models the behavior that signifies support for women leaders and indicates zero tolerance for sexual harassment, there will be no more questioning the authority of women managers, no more double standard in justifying decisions made by women in leadership roles. Second, we must acknowledge and proactively address the long legacy of policies, practices, and norms that thwart women's equality. Entrenched systemic inequities will persist as long as we enable them or choose to ignore them. Addressing this sordid history requires much more than a commitment to making gender blind decisions today. We must instead work actively and in our daily lives to reverse inequality. And third, we must all view the place we have earned in our professions, whether woman or man, high on the ladder or midway up, as a position from which to pay it forward to those working their way up. Reaching out to mentor, to sponsor, to coach, and to share the path forward, we elevate those coming along after us, particularly encouraging women who are rising up through the ranks. Here I want to underscore the critical difference between mentorship and sponsorship. As a female colleague once said to me, Women do not lack mentors. They lack sponsors, or put another way, advocates. In other words, men are always happy to offer advice, which if anything can inadvertently serve to reinforce the imbalanced power dynamic between men and women. But it is a completely different matter to actively promote the career of a colleague, to put one's own reputation on the line to push for her promotion, to insist she be offered a training opportunity, to speak up if she is facing sexism, or to recommend her for a new job. It is very likely someone advocated for you on your way up. Someone who didn't just pick up the phone when you called, but someone who picked up the phone to make a call on your behalf. I urge every one of you here in the audience today, whatever your gender, to commit to sponsorship for women in your professional lives. Finally, there is something all men can do in their personal lives to support women's economic empowerment. There is anecdotal evidence that men have been more involved in household, tax, household tasks in India during the pandemic and lockdown. This is a practice we should carry forward from these difficult times. And it's something the girls in our lives should expect from their partners when they are grown. To conclude my remarks today, I want to outline some of what we're doing at the US consulate to underscore that when it comes to women's empowerment, we endeavor every day to walk the walk. We strive daily to weave gender equality into all our work, whether partnering with the Indian government and NGOs in Western India to advance equality for women and girls, or ensuring that the Department of State's many exchange programs include an equitable number of women and girls as participants. Even something as simple as ensuring gender balance in our meetings with business, political, media, and other civic leaders has great value. We insist there are equitable numbers of women and men on panel discussions that American officers speak on. I personally committed years ago never to participate in a panel that lacked gender diversity. If every man made the same pledge, we could put an immediate and permanent end to panels, that is, panels comprised exclusively of men. Last month, 
The consulate recognized the United Nations annual campaign, 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence, through a series of gender-related programs and online initiatives. In one program, we built on five consecutive years of encouraging filmmakers to produce short films that promote women's empowerment and combat gender-based violence by working with a National Geographic photographer to tell women's stories through still photography. Participants join workshops to learn new photography skills and turn their eyes toward dramatic images from around our consular district that inspired us and made us reflect on the power of equality. We then conducted a competition and awarded the five pictures that best captured women's security and empowerment. Likewise, our hashtag she the change digital campaign late last year highlighted the work of 12 innovative female social entrepreneurs based in rural and urban areas of Western India. The featured women shed light on their struggles and offered advice for the next generation of female social entrepreneurs. In non-COVID times, visitors to our on-site American library, Doski House, participate in research and programs that raise awareness about opportunities for young girls in STEM fields, entrepreneurship, and environmental sustainability. Our Education USA advisors help young women explore a path to undergraduate study in the U.S. To find out more or propose a training, mentorship, or other collaboration with us, I encourage you to contact our public affairs section. Our commercial and political and economic affairs sections, which engage on policy, business, and economic developments in our consular district, follow a standard operating procedure that ensures we hear from women in all of our travel, meetings, and strategic planning. We have been building a list of key women in all five of the states we cover, and our staff actively recommends women leaders in all fields for me, the ambassador, and senior visiting U.S. officials to engage when in India. This seems like a simple thing, building a list of contacts and then making it a priority to regularly meet with them. But it was somewhat uncomfortable when we first launched this effort <clears throat> to realize just how few of our regular contacts were women. We are actively seeking to remedy that in every field of engagement. I mentioned these actions and programs not by way of patting ourselves on the back with full recognition that they are but drops in the ocean. I only wish to underscore our commitment to partnering with India to advance our mutual objectives of women's empowerment. We cannot rest until we achieve equal participation and equal remuneration for women in the workforce at all levels and in all fields. And when I say we cannot rest, allow me to share a specific example from our own recent experience here at the consulate of a problem we faced and how we are seeking to course correct. I mentioned earlier the photo competition we ran to promote images of women's empowerment. While we are proud of this initiative, one key outcome was not gender diverse. We had a diverse award panel who conducted a blind review of the photo submissions and chose five winners, four of whom turned out to be men. When I inquired, it turned out that this was reflective of the participant pool, about 80% of whom were men, despite our explicit efforts to encourage participation by women. So, what are we gonna do about this the next time? First and foremost, we need to do a better job reaching women to encourage them to participate in our programs. Given male dominance of the Indian online universe, for example, we need to expand our outreach efforts beyond social media. This may be more complicated and time consuming, but it is necessary to achieve the outcomes we seek. Another possible solution is to make diversity of awardees, including gender diversity, an explicit criterion for our awards panels. This would obviously require a review, a review process that is not completely blind, but again, some flexibility, creativity, and effort is needed to reach our objective of gender equity. I offer this anecdote to underscore my, underscore my key message. Promoting gender equity requires examining every decision through a gender lens, asking pointed and often uncomfortable questions about suboptimal outcomes, and committing to taking steps to course correct. This is not something that will be achieved solely by equal opportunity policies or by establishing diversity and inclusion committees, although these are useful and necessary steps. Gender equity can only be achieved through daily persistence from each and every individual in this virtual room and beyond. We have a hard work, we have hard work and a long road ahead of us, but I believe that with our collective attention and efforts from people like you, we can anchor and accelerate the progress we're making. To employ one of my favorite expressions, our journey of 1000 miles begins with just one step. We have taken many steps, 
but clearly have many, many more to go. And while my focus today has been on women, it is important to underscore that inclusion does not stop with gender. Every workforce is strengthened and enriched by maximum diversity. I encourage you to support entrepreneurs from all segments of society to explore ways to expand the inclusion of groups who benefit from India's economic opportunities and in so doing strengthen economic growth by increasing equity and tapping into the country's rich multi multicultural heritage. I would like to once again thank you for your time and kind attention. Your being here today to engage on this important topic demonstrates your openness to examining this problem, and I hope your commitment to addressing it. I look forward to working with you in our collective efforts to lift up and support women in the workplace. Thank you. Lisa, you are muted. David, thank you so much. That was such a powerful call to arms to get us going this morning. You really brought the fire and you fired us up. And I think it sets the stage for Dipti Ravula to take this conversation forward with our two phenomenal women leaders. So Dipti, let me turn this over to you. Thank you, Nisha. Um, good evening, everyone, and good morning to everybody watching this from um, across the world. Uh, thank you so much, uh, CG Rans, for setting the context. And uh, Nisha, thank you so much for the wonderful introductions. So um, now we'll dive right into the uh, panel. Kiran and Anne, such a pleasure uh, being on the panel with you. And uh, we'll get started. We have a lot to cover. So Kiran, I'll start with you. We have seen some very glaring data points from us, as pointed out by CG Brands, as well as uh, Ms. Biswal in their opening remarks. In the corporate sector globally, 30% of the C-suite women or VP women, uh, VP level women, reported that the pandemic has altered the course of their career and about 25% would leave their post sooner than expected because of the pandemic. How does a broader question of gender parity apply today in light of the global COVID-19 pandemic and uh, what are the immediate steps uh, organizations uh, should take? So we'll start with that question for you, Kiran. Wow, that's quite a broad question. But uh, first and foremost, let me thank, uh, you know, David and Nisha for, you know, inviting me to this panel and it's great to be with Anne. But let me start by saying that uh, gender uh, inequality, you know, starts with the skewed distribution that uh, women face when it comes to the distribution of assets or inheritance or you know uh, workplace employment or you know basically representation in the socio-political institutions now i think you know you need to see more women just like david just mentioned like you know if, if you don't have enough women participating uh, in a selection process then you're obviously going to get skewed selection and that's where the problem starts I think we have enough role models of really good women who are doing outstanding jobs in every field. So I don't think there's a dearth of, uh, you know, role models for other women to look up to. But it's really about the cultural and socioeconomic, uh, you know, biases that we need to contend with. And if you think about it, um, Economic empowerment is what will, you know, bridge this uh, gap, I personally believe. So I think economic, uh, you know, uh, empowerment of women is extremely important. How do you economically empower a woman on and get to an equal parity with men? You heard David say that in India, uh, you know, we are at a 20 percent, uh, you know, wage level of men. Uh, and compared to even Bangladesh, which is at 40% uh, and so on and so forth. Now, how do we bridge that gap is the question. So why are we not uh, addressing the same job markets? Why are we not addressing the same jobs? Why is that funnel effect preventing us from really getting to the top of organizations? I mean, if you look at our own corporate world, there is a lot of tokenism in everything we do. The government, of course, is very supportive of women's issues and, you know, they've, they've brought out some excellent policies 
which are very, very women empowering. But having said that, what has corporate India done to really, really make sure that it's that gender inclusion is not just a tokenism and it's not just good for their annual reports to say that they're doing a lot, but how are they really walking the talk is the question. And here you can see that of the top 100, uh, you know, BSC companies in India, 91 of them have only one woman director, which means it's just sort of ticking a box. Why don't we have more women on boards? And I always find that when they want to find a woman on a board, it's the same group of women they are basically looking at. You have to increase the, the, the you know, the, the canvas. I think there are many, many women who can play very effective board roles, who can actually come and assume great leadership roles, but unfortunately we don't give them a chance. I know I have been in, involved in a large number of selection activities where we are actually forcing people uh, to make sure that there are women represented in the, in the candidature. But I also know that when you actually come to selecting the final candidates, people, both men and women, start introducing selection criteria that are so stacked against women. You want them to have a certain amount of experience. You want them to have a certain, uh, you know, uh, hands on experience with X, Y and Z. And that's where then you find that the woman doesn't have everything and you choose a man. I think we have to really find ways of making it a fair uh, process for women, uh, especially first time women. Uh, who get very intimidated by the process. And uh, that's where it all starts, Deepthi. So I know I've been through it myself. I know how it was to build my company in the early days where it was a credibility building challenge that I had to overcome, where people didn't take me seriously just because of my gender. People didn't want to work for me just because I was a woman. People didn't want to even lend me money uh, from banks just because they felt I was a security risk, you know, things like that. I think you have to get over these perception hurdles. It's going to take time, but as David very rightly said, we need sponsorship, not mentorship. Mentorship is there, but we need that very positive sponsorship. So I'll end there because I'm sure Anne can add to what I'm saying. Thank you, Kiran. Uh, this is uh, you brought some very good points about tokenism, and uh, I'm happy that you're actually speaking it up because that is one of the overcorrection problems that we actually see today about uh, having more women on boards. So, and coming down to you, um, CG Rance uh, very clearly mentioned that you know there is a uh, there is a lot of uh, studies that actually show, and uh, you yourself has been on uh, so many um, uh, studies as well. You've spoken about it. Uh, the, if there is gender equality, the GDP grows and uh, social development happens. But uh, what is the link between gender equality? Uh, has it actually received the same kind of acceptance in the boardroom? If we say, you know, there is gender equality and that is going to lead to better outcomes for a corporate. Has it actually been accepted in the boardroom? That is the first part of the question. And second thing is, what is MasterCard doing in this regard? Because we talk a lot about like, you know, more women means better benefits, but has it actually been accepted by a corporate, uh, uh, many of the corporates that you've been part of? Well, thank you very much, Deepthi. And uh, it's great to be on here with David, Nisha and Kieran. And I cannot um, say how much I agree with what Kieran has just said absolutely 100% agreement about things like let's not have one and done just one woman on a board let's not have the same women showing up on every board in Europe they're called golden skirts because <laughs> it's the same women on every board and um, and let's change the playing field things are stacked against women you know we're not playing on a level playing field um, and we need to, as David said, call out the biases. Now, what about boards? I'm actually the global chair of the 30% club. I would love that club to be in India, by the way. It's not there yet, but it's my ambition that it is going to be in every G20 country. And we are in many G20 countries. We're in the States. 
we're in Canada, we're in the UK, we're in Australia, we're in Japan, where we've just opened in Mexico. We're in about 20 countries around the world. And this movement started in Britain in um, about 10 years ago, when there were less than 10% women on the top boards on the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250. And the way that it started was that Helena Morrissey, um, the founder, she went and talked to the men. She talked to the CEOs and the chairs of companies. And she said, there's a good business case here for women on boards. Are you willing to support me? And some of the enlightened men stepped up. Um, did we lose Anne? Anne? Uh, hello? Yes, yeah. Anne. Sorry, we yeah. asked you. Yeah. yeah. So I'm still here? Yeah. Yes. No, yeah. Thank you. Um, so th the men stood up and said, we commit to having 30%, at least 30% women on our boards. The chairman and the CEOs of companies signed up to this. And today in the FTSE uh, 100, we have 35% women on boards. And uh, in the FTSE 250, 33%. So the thing is that by these men standing up and saying we support it and actually taking it on themselves to have aspirational targets, they've changed the corporate world in Britain. And we're busy changing that corporate world in other parts of the world as well. Um, Japan signed up two years ago. They had 7% women on boards two years ago. They now have over 13%. Um, so I actually think, and David mentioned this, that sometimes when you just have quotas, that's problematic because people are just ticking boxes and they're obeying rules. If you get the business world to step up and say, we believe this is the right thing to do and we're gonna set targets, not quotas, you can achieve much more in many countries. So, so let's hope that you know India goes this way too. Um, in the second part of your question, uh, Deepthi, you, you, you mentioned about uh, what's MasterCard doing? Well, I love what MasterCard's doing because I've been very involved in that myself. Uh, we, we thought about it in three ways. What are we doing for our people? What are we doing for our markets? And what do we do for society? In our people column, we, we've made sure everywhere in the world, in all over two country, 200 countries that we operate, that we pay men and women exactly the same amount for doing the same job, equal pay for equal work. And um, there is, you know, that is just across the board everywhere. Now we do have a gender pay gap because there are more senior men than there are senior women in MasterCard, but that pay cap gap is published on a global basis and that is about 8%. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've rolled out global maternity and paternity leave everywhere in the world, four months full paid leave for men and for women. I love the fact we're doing this for men too, because it creates a level playing field for the young people. We're not looking at someone saying she's going to be a mother and take time off work. We're looking at someone saying they are going to be a parent and they're going to take time off work. And I think the point that David raised earlier about men supporting women at home, that's hugely important, and especially the whole area of childcare, making sure that it's a shared thing. Um, I could go on for a long time. I'm just going to conclude this answer by saying in the society pillar, we've connected up half a billion people into the financial system since 2015. We're going for our second half a billion. A large amount of those are women because women were more excluded digitally and financially than men were. And we've also committed to help 25 million SMEs on a global basis, 25 million women SMEs, because we set the target of 50 million SMEs to connect up in the next five years. 
and uh, and we said let's not just differentiate between men and women we want 25 million of those to be women led and women founded companies and this will presumably help the things that Kieran was talking about, about getting access, getting funding, allow you being allowed to run your own business. Um, so, so that's the kind of thing that Mastercard's doing. Great. Thank you so much, Anne, for for the answer. Uh, so, I'll come back to you, Kieran. Um, the question I have for you now is that, you know, we have we have heard from uh, many studies. We've heard from CG Rand that there is uh, with more women being part of the workforce. Uh, there is a increased productivity and it adds to the GDP of the economy and the company also performs better. Have you in your experience um, actually noticed this as part of uh, many of your board memberships and uh, have you been able to convince uh, many of the boards that you're on to actually, you know, take up uh, more uh, participation of women? And if so, some good numbers, please. Well, let me be very honest, Deepthi. In India, we just don't see enough women to make that assessment. So whilst we can see some really smart women, some very high performing women, there's simply not enough of them in any or one organization in India, at least, to say that this organization is more efficient because of the women, if you know what I mean, right? So I, I think what we really need to focus on at this point in time is playing to what Anne just said, how do we make sure that women get paid an equal wage for the equal job, right? And how do we create more and more of those equal jobs, which are then uh, finding women occupying those roles? So for instance, in our organization, what I find is that there are certain uh, cliched biases, I would say, so, for instance, uh, you know, which I'm trying to change and disrupt. So whilst we have a very large representation of women in our research and development, where almost 40 percent are women. Um, and again, there we find a few good leaders and strong leaders, which is which is good to see. Uh, when I look at, say, some of our other divisions, I don't see why our sales and marketing should be so dominated by men. I don't see why our manufacturing should be so dominated by men. Uh, even our finance department uh, should have more women is what I'm saying. So I just find that there is a mindset that certain jobs are best done by men. And that is the mindset we have to break. And I keep pushing my guys saying, why can't you have women uh, on the workflow, uh, in uh, you know, doing a, a, a job. And they say, no, no, you know, it's because these are 24 by 7 operations and, you know, women cannot be made to come in uh, late shifts. So therefore, we cannot uh, get more women to do this job. Now, I'm saying, look, I'm sure if, if you actually made the environment right for women, they would actually not mind doing it. And when I... Um, Actually, then I actually pushed the government. I realized that actually I said, look, if women can do a 24 by 7 job in IT companies, why can't they do the same job in a biotech company? I, I don't get the logic. So then, of course, they said as per the labor policy, we are not supposed to allow women to work in night shifts. So I went to the government and I said, please change that policy. It is it is very, very gender uh, anti -gen uh, gender inclusive. So, of course, the government actually, I must say, you know, with full credit to them, they have decided to change that norm in Karnataka, at least. OK, so I think that's something which we have to lobby for. There are a lot of policies and unnecessary policies which actually are stacked against women. So I think there are many of these issues that we don't understand. These are the underlying causes which actually, you know, lead to these kind of issues where you, you know, unknowingly you actually then create a bias which is then difficult to remove so i think we need to look into these kind of matters so i for one i'm trying to push my organization and my male leadership to say hey listen one of your uh, you know sort of uh, uh, you know your performance indicators kpis is going to be uh, about hiring more women uh, in your team and I would like to see succession planning that also involves women. So you ought to almost push it. So you need. So I'm the sponsor here, 
pushing them, but I want men to be sponsors because I think Anne is very right that Anne David is very right that unless you have men who understand the importance of gender inclusiveness, uh, I think you will not be successful in the long term. Thank you so much, uh, Kiran. That is uh, quite enlightening. I'm happy to share that in uh, my own state of uh, Telangana and uh, Hyderabad, uh, we've actually made uh, uh, three shift uh, operations uh, viable for women as well. So we are trying to do more uh, support in terms of transportation and logistics also. And I'm happy that uh, leaders like you are also championing the cause that is going to increase uh, the pool of women who can actually create the funnel to go on to the next step. Thank you so much. So and uh, coming down to you, the question that uh, uh, I have for you is coming back to the 30 percent on the board. See, we have 30% uh, of uh, women on the boards. And as uh, Kiran was mentioning, the tokenism aspect, I know in Britain that, you know, you mentioned, you spoke about the golden skirts and, you know, the same women being there. But how do we make sure that, you know, in a country like Britain, uh, where there is a little bit more advocacy, how do, are you able to find more women to be, uh, you know, in this 30%? Are these uh, going to be different? How are you, how are you working towards that? To remove tokenism, yeah. as, as she said. Yes, absolutely. So, um, yeah, we've got 35 percent and it's not the same women. <laughs> and um, so there's hundreds of women now in Britain that are on boards. And um, what, one of the ways that we actually did this was very early on, we launched um, a big 30 percent club mentorship scheme across the country. And we actually had women who were um, the be just below board level, mentored by men that were on boards um, in other companies. So, for example, if I put somebody in from MasterCard, they might be mentored by somebody from, I don't know, British Airways. Um, you know, so it's not your own company. Now, why is this important? Because actually it creates a network between the men and the women out in the wider marketplace. It also causes a lot of very um, honest conversations to go on between women executives in one company and male CEOs, chairs, board members in another company. Um, now this scheme has about two and a half thousand. It's it's in its ninth year. This year it has two and a half thousand people involved in it in Britain. It's now expanded to some called Mission Include to make sure that we start picking up people from different ethnicities, people with disabilities, um, extending the diversity and inclusion rollout even further. Um, and, uh, and I'm very excited about it because it has caused many women to rise up and to be able to get board seats. Um, and also now in Britain, um, we've, we're actually one person of colour on every board and uh, because we're a very diverse society as you know and and because we're the 30 percent club we said uh, and we want 50 percent of those seats to go to women of colour um and uh, and it was quite interesting the ceos and the chairs rang me up and said Anne, are you kidding about this new goal of 50 percent of seats to women uh, can we achieve that because they all sign up to it of course and uh, and i said of course you can achieve it because we're already running at 42 percent right now um so so the thing is it's good to have the statistics at your fingertips as david had earlier and uh, and i love the fact actually um that uh, Kieran's actually talked about real examples of um, laws that stop you doing things to help women succeed. You know, this idea, oh, women can't work the night shift. I mean, what's happening in our hospitals around the world? Women are working the night shift on the front line against COVID everywhere in the world. It's absolutely ridiculous to think that we couldn't do 24 seven jobs in every area of business. And as you mentioned in the introduction, or uh, Nisha did, um, I actually was the first woman offshore in Britain. Uh, that was back in the 1980s. And at that time, you know, I, I passed my survival training. I climbed into helicopters. Um, you know, I, I flew off onto the oil and gas rigs and um, there was no reason women couldn't do that job. 
Thank you, Anne. That is a very uh, inspiring and uh, and, a, and a role model kind of a story that I think India should also emulate. And uh, with Kiran and uh, Nisha and uh, so many women leaders, I think we can uh, get started with that direction. And we need a 30% club in India also, I think. And uh, for the audience, if you have any questions, please do type them in the Q&A box. Uh, if you want to ask um, Anne, um, Anne or Kiran or even David and Nisha any question that you want, please uh, type it up in the Q&A box. So, uh, uh, Kiran, the next question is for you. We've heard a lot about how women entrepreneurs are and, you know, will become the drivers of many economies. And we've seen a lot of momentum as well. There is a lot of talk. There is so much focus, as you rightly said, on enabling more women to be entrepreneurs. But uh, we can all agree. And uh, humbly, I say that uh, the outcome that we see is not uh, in, in, in the way that we expect. So can you help us understand what are the top three things that we as India and uh, let's say USIBC and we have as enablers should do to get some uh, improved near term results and exponential long term results? Top three. You know, as you can imagine, Deepti, I'm, you know, approached by lots of women led startups. OK, and their single complaint is that they don't get access to capital. I'll be very honest. I mean, that's the single complaint they all have. And they all say that, look, you know, we feel so cheated because uh, a male, uh, you know, startup uh, gets access to that capital for an inferior idea. And at least that's what, you know, an entrepreneur feels. And yet with my idea, which I went for a, a similar kind of uh, a capital raise, I got turned down. And what's wrong? And I said, well, you know, it is unfair what happens because I've been through it myself. Uh, I think women need to network. Women need to, you know, uh, exp you know, make, I mean, I always joke. I say, you know, a man makes a small idea sound big and a woman makes a big idea sound small. I think women need to actually uh, be more confident and sell themselves and their ideas better to an investor. I think that is a real challenge because I think there are um, uh, you know, unfortunately, the money is in the hands of men. There are very few women uh, VC investors. So again, you're, you're kind of depending on making that impact and that impression on the VC. And if the VC feels you're not articulate enough or you're not selling it boldly enough or if they for some reason feel that, women, you know, it's, it's perception, uh, Deepti, you know that. Women are not considered to be ambitious. Women are not considered to be risk takers. Women are not capable of, uh, you know, being fearless and and enduring. These are all perceptions. And I think I busted every one of those myths. I keep telling people if I can do it, any woman can do it. OK, and I think that is what we need to focus on. I think women need to feel uh, women again need sponsorship when it comes to uh, access to capital because you know as someone who runs that we hub mm -hmm. that uh, because of your efforts you're able to actually get uh, women to have access to capital i also know that a lot of government schemes we are trying to make sure that it is a level playing field for women and men entrepreneurs startup entrepreneurs and i'm really glad that they have a kind of a selection committee where uh, you know there is uh, equal representation of men and women in many of these government bodies where then i think uh, you know people are judged uh, in a very unbiased way in terms of the ideas rather than the 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 personality they represent you know mm -hmm. so i just think that there are challenges but we really need to focus on this aspect of entrepreneurship it is really about that access to capital. If you invest in women, if you allow them to have access to capital, believe me, this tribe will grow. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Kiran. And one thing I would like to also uh, ask you as a follow up question is that uh, what do you think about, uh, you know, ambitious is not considered as a positive trait uh, for uh, women, at least in many spaces. So how would you like to address that? Because being called ambitious is uh, considered in a negative connotation, so to speak, sometimes. So how I would you like? Women should, I think women should uh, not listen to such silly comments. I think they should uh, close <laughs> their ears and get on with what they want to do. <laughs> I always tell women, don't listen to the naysayers. Don't listen to all this 
silly criticism and perception hurdles that you that you encounter just do what you have to do and you know with blinkers on almost <laughs> Thank you, Kiran. And and this is something that you can uh, help us understand a bit more. And uh, this is something that a lot of the mid-level uh, female managers actually do face. So they feel many times uh, in a corporation, many mid-level managers who are women who are doing really well in the company feel that they are kind of an outlier in a decision making process. They may not mostly agree with the decision being made, but they don't want to say anything against it because it might actually affect them negatively because they feel it's not safe. So it would be really interesting to know from you. What are your views on this? Do you think it exists? And if so, how should we tackle these kinds of problems? And uh, what are the efforts that you are actually taking up in your own organization to handle these? Well, for sure it exists, <laughs> Deepthi. Otherwise, you wouldn't be asking the question. And uh, and I actually think it um, it can be exacerbated by culture. So, for example, in a in an American culture or in a, a British culture, people feel much safer about speaking out and expressing their opinion. And in actual fact, uh, I know in an American culture, particularly, um, you're taught to do that at school. I remember my my daughter going to school in America, and you know being very confident standing up on her stool and explaining about how she's going to lead the world at the age of four or five. <laughs> British education was a little bit more, you know, a be quiet and listen to the teacher. <laughs> but um, but it starts at school level in America and it goes through into the business world. And um, and I think but I know that in India um, and I've experienced it myself, you know, when I've traveled to India on business and um, talking to people at middle management level, there is, um, you know, there's a great respect for authority. It's a much more hierarchical world um, and uh, and therefore people sometimes can feel very uncomfortable about speaking out. I think one of the great things that you can do from a company level is kind of have these uh, groups that are actually run by the employees. We have groups all over the company. We have um, Women's Leadership Network. Every woman in our company is part of the Women's Leadership Network. The funny thing is that half the men are now part of the Women's Leadership Network. I was making a, a presentation in Colombia uh, last year and, um, and after my town hall to the, all of the staff, they said to me, will you talk to the Women's Leadership Network? And I said, of course. And then nobody left the room. And I said, well, are the women not just staying? And they said, no, no, the men are part of it as well now, which I think is a fantastic vote of confidence. Um, but other networks that exist, you know, are all sorts of different groups, um, you know, um, LBGDTQ groups and um, disability, people with disability, lots of different groups uh, inside the company um, with different interests, um, uh, vets, uh, people who've been in the armed forces groups um, and um, and they can be great spaces for people to talk about their experiences. Um, the other thing that I think is, is really good is that we do um, employee and sur feedback surveys anonymously across the company every year. And, uh, and people do get the option to express their opinion and put their comments in there and so on. So, you know, if they haven't spoken out before, and I hope that they do before any such survey comes around, but it is an opportunity to pulse check the organization and say, what are, what are a lot of people saying? We get tremendously good feedback on those surveys and um, and it gets reported through to things like Glassdoor by the employees, which is another very opaque way, uh, an opaque, transparent way of sharing what goes on inside a company. But at the same time, we also hear uh, feedback about things that need to be improved. Oh, you know, we could be a bit less bureaucratic. Oh, it's sometimes difficult to get if you're a middle manager to get people to make decisions. I have to go to three or four different people, this kind of thing. And I think that's a sign of a very healthy culture that people are prepared to stand up and say those things and feel safe about it. They should feel safe about it. Thank you, Anne. So we should try to incorporate that and I'm sure uh, Kiran is all, you already have that very safe uh, space already. So Kiran, uh, coming down to the next question that I have for you, and this is a little bit uh, moving away from it. 
So um, I wanted to ask you, and I've heard you speak about this a few times, but I want to ask you again. What do you think are your critical professional qualifications? We all know they are amazing personal and organizational building characteristics that have underpinned your success uh, to making it to the boardroom and being a leader in the business world. Because a lot of times organization building is something that also women entrepreneurs and women should focus on quite a lot. So can you just uh, very uh, tell us a little bit more about this? You know, as a leader, I have always uh, believed that uh, leaders should be very approachable. Uh, I think you need to earn the trust of your people. You need to carry people along in terms of what you're trying to do, because, you know, I, you know, having been an entrepreneur who built an organization from scratch, I had to have a team that shared that idea that I was so excited about. Right. So I've always believed that when you get people to buy into uh, something that you're doing, it's always a very a uh, sound way of of uh, you know executing on a strategy so if you have a strategy that people buy into then it's easier to execute it um, i've also believed very strongly in a non hierarchical uh, structure i believe that if you have a role based company rather than a, a hierarchical kind of structure it always works better because i think you can keep you can actually you know disrupt egos and insecurities, which I think hierarchies create in a big way. I've actually been a very common sense uh, kind of a leader. I believe that, you know, as a as someone who really hasn't had a business school education, I've used a lot of intuition, common sense and human values to really, you know, lead the business because I think you have to really be empathetic. I want to be known as an empathetic leader. And I think a lot of women make very good empathetic leader leaders, which is very important, I feel, because this is what HR needs to be uh, cognizant of. You know, if you look at most of the problems in companies or even what keeps leaders awake at night, it's really, you know, people issues. You know, you, you want people to be efficient, productive and energized and and happy working in the in in in, in a company. And I think that comes from get, making them have a sense of ownership. I've always believed that, um, you know, my style of management has been I get people to own a problem rather than perform a task. Mm -hmm. And I feel that, you know, when you own a problem and you solve the problem, it is empowering, it is enabling. And I feel that's the way we we've gone about, uh, you know, nurturing talent and getting people to, you know, have a great career development path. So that's really been my style of management and I feel that's where I have been effective. And I try to sort of, uh, you know, osmotically, you know, transmit a lot of these kind of uh, aspects of management to a lot of my colleagues. And those who do it well, I think are very good leaders and some of them are women. And I find that that works very well. Thank you, Kiran. And uh, yes, thank you so much for actually uh, talking about it because I notice it every time I meet you and that is so inspiring always. And uh, coming down to you, Anne, and you are the first of many things, as you mentioned, uh, you're the first woman qualified to go offshore in Britain at the start of your career. You have been a leader in many diverse sectors, including banking, uh, oil and gas, financial services. So the question I have for you is how do you navigate pivots? And when did it stop uh, being about you being a woman to just focusing on you being a leader? When did gender become a non-factor as you navigated your career in so many different sectors? And you're on mute. Yeah, I don't think gender ever becomes a non-factor, Deepthi, because you're always a woman. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the thing is that it, it can actually act um, positively as well as negatively. Um, certainly when I was a young engineer, um, you know, you stand out from the crowd. And sometimes when you're making your way up the ladder, standing out from the crowd is really helpful. So, so you know, you should use every opportunity that you have. Sorry, the sun has come out here in Britain. You should use every opportunity that you have to um, to make yourself successful. Um, I've always had male bosses. 
And I've always had male sponsors who've been incredibly helpful to me. And I've also worked for male leaders who have been really difficult to work with. And some of those people have been the ones that actually help you grow the most, because what you find when you're in that situation is you take control, you make your own decisions. And um, and that is, you know, something that makes you grow stronger all the time. I loved listening to uh, Kieran's um, comments about, you know, getting rid of hierarchy and and using empathy to lead. I mean, everything that you read about today is all about empathetic leaders. I think women can naturally go into that style of leadership. And I think that it happens in the corporate world and it also happens in politics, you know, um, uh, Jacinda Ahern down in New Zealand. Um, you know, even a very strong politician in, in Europe like Angela Merkel leads with such clarity and such connection with people uh, because she explains things so simply and so factually that people, tr you know, there's, there's trust developed there. And I think that um, Kieran has said, you know, about people, her employees trusting her. Actually, Edelman have just produced their annual research showing that. You've gone mute, I think. Yeah. Corporate lead. It's a little bit mm -hmm. Um, so I think they're employed. Um, Is it okay? Much yeah. better. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Um, I was just on the question of trust, and Kieran had mentioned that you know she she develops trust in her employees and so on. And Kieran, you're not alone as a CEO because most CEOs have a higher level of trust now than other leaders such as politicians and so forth. And their employees are actually listening to what they say during COVID and they're expecting their corporate leaders to actually step in and help them, you know, solve social pro problems at this time. And the corporate leaders are actually stepping up as well and they're forming coalitions that address things such as climate change. I know at MasterCard we've done things such as um, uh, put money into therapeutics and vaccine development and you could say well that's very far from you know a, a payments company that deals with three billion consumers but it's not that far because businesses cannot succeed in a failing world. Um, and so I think there's many opportunities for leaders today to actually show who they are and to actually have a moral purpose for their company. And, uh, you know, and they do that by having a moral purpose for themselves and by leading the right way. Um, so, yeah. Uh, thank you, Anne. So uh, that is that is something that uh, we we'll all be doing. So uh, before we go into the audience questions and we have a lot of questions, I wanted to ask both of you uh, one common question. So um, there's a, as Anne pointed out, uh, the, the, the examples that she cited about leadership are actually crisis leadership. So I wanted to understand from both of you, Kiran and Anne, uh, what are your thoughts on crisis leadership and if there is any gender difference uh, when it comes to uh, being a leader uh, based on your gender at all? Kiran, we, can we start with you? Well, you know, I think, you know, crisis leadership is 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 I think something which as a leader you need to address uh, by kind of uh, making sure that you are taking the lead. You've got to obviously be very uh, in control when when you're dealing with a crisis and you've got to lead from the front. Uh, you know, that is one time you should show that you are able to lead and that you're not just taking a back seat and delegating all the responsibilities to people who then have to shoulder a huge amount of responsibilities. I think you have to be there out with the troops and, and, and fighting the crisis together with them. That's the one time the whole aspect of leading and creating that enormous team spirit is extremely important. I mean, you have to do it all the time, but during a, a crisis, uh, that that very that uh, that clarity of, uh, you know, uh, role uh, sort of uh, roles and distribution of responsibilities is extremely crucial. 
So I think you need to show that calm, that uh, confidence, that uh, strength of, of, of uh, leadership to be able to get over such a crisis. So I don't think it really matters whether you're a man or a woman. Uh, and that's one time where I think it doesn't matter what your gender is, as long as you know what your role is about uh, a leader dealing with a crisis. Thank you, Kiran. And Anne, quick, uh, quick uh, summary. Or quick yeah, um, I completely agree with um, Kieran on that, that it doesn't matter whether you're, I agree, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. I think that it's very important to lead with empathy and to lead with clarity and also to make everyone uh, around you feel very comfortable that you can take decisions um, even though you don't have 100% of the data. Um, my One of my biggest crisis jobs was that I became the CEO of Lehman Holdings during the last financial crisis across Europe into Russia and the Middle East. Um, and I actually um, managed the team that unwound the six trillion swap portfolio when Lehman was in bankruptcy. And quite a lot of the time you're operating with, um, but, you know, insufficient information to be 100 percent sure that the decisions you're taking are correct. But you have to take them because otherwise you could destroy um, value and impact the financial system in a very negative way. And I've always found that if you are very honest um, and you just reflect um, clearly why you're taking actions, you make it transparent to everyone. And I was actually operating under the bankruptcy rules of America, the chapter 11 rules. And the great thing about those is that you, you actually put things out I think we lost and again weeks and you are making some uh, so uh, while Anne comes back so maybe uh, we'll just uh, go for the audience question and Kiran may I also request you to make fi your final comments on this or oh, Anne is just back now and we lost you for a bit there so we are we had just moved into audience questions so, <laughs> okay sorry. just move into audience questions I don't want to waste your time thank you I'm sorry about that. Um, so uh, the questions Anne and Kiran are um, around uh, around uh, the sponsorship that both of you have spoken about uh, along with the CG um, um, brands. So I want the question that they have is how do we uh, get more gender parity and diversity and sponsorship in a country like India? And uh, we want to hear both of your thoughts on that Anne as well as Kiran. And could I also request both of you to make your uh, closing comments and because we are uh, apparently close to the, the ending time. Thank you. Well, I, I think that um, I, I would love to see in India um, this cross company mentoring ship scheme um, set up in the same way that we have it here in Britain, because I think that that would be fantastic for actually helping women connect with senior men across the whole whole corporate space and helping them build a network. I think that's something very positive that could be done there. I also uh, agree with Anne and I personally would like to see industry bodies really play a big role in focusing on gender parity in, in a much bigger way. So, you know, we've got all these wonderful industry bodies many of which have been actually headed by women presidents. You know, whether it's CII, whether it's FICI, whether it's ASOCHAM, whether it's NASCOM and many, many other industry bodies, they've all actually focused a lot on gender issues and gender parity. And I think that has helped a lot. You know, when I when I interact with a lot of them, I think that helps a lot. So I think we need to put a lot more energy into these programs and make it much bigger. Uh, again, it shouldn't end up being a very small initiative that remains small. It needs to have uh, a much bigger focus and it needs to expand in a much bigger way. So I have attended a number of these, uh, you know, and I don't want them to be separate uh, divisions of the industry body. Like they have this Fiki Ladies Organization. I think I would rather that it is integrated in the main industry body and that you give much more serious focus 
uh, to gender issues and women's issues because otherwise it gets a kind of a different treatment is what I feel. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kiran. Uh, that is actually something that we should do. And uh, when people ask me why I had Viha, which is a separate platform for women and what the plans for the eight years of Viha or 10 years are, we keep saying that it should stop existing because it needs to be a part of something bigger and uh, it should uh, bring a gender lens to everything we do in government. So thank you so much, Anne and Kiran, for your very, uh, uh, very detailed and uh, in insightful uh, uh, answers to many of the uh, topics that we wanted to discuss. As always, a pleasure speaking to you, Kiran, and Anne, such a pleasure having you here. So now I'll hand it off to Nisha to kind of summarize and also uh, close out uh, today's uh, event. Thank you, Nisha. Over to thank you. Thank you, Dipti. Thank you for such a fantastic program and uh, wonderful moderation. I really enjoyed hearing uh, the insights and perspectives and lessons learned that we were able to hear from our two phenomenal uh, executives, Karen Mazumdar Shah and uh, Ann Cairns. I also really enjoyed the call to arms that David Rance gave us uh, when he when he put us together, and I think what we can what we can easily learn from um, today's conversation is that while there have been gains uh, in bringing women more into the workforce and into the leadership, that there is a lot of work ahead of us, and there are really strong best practices. Uh, and mechanisms and recommendations that were discussed today uh, that can help bring about that change that we need to see. For example, we talked about the fact that we need to talk about financing and how we get more access to capital. Uh, we talked about uh, boardroom representation and um, how we make that meaningful, diverse, and not uh, um, tokenism. Um, we talked about the the sponsorship and not just the mentorship opportunities that can help women have and build the kind of access that they need. Um, I think there are a lot of different ways in which organizations like the US India Business Council can partner with the tremendous leadership that we have across our industry in the United States, India, and, and in the global community, um, bringing in leaders like Kiran and Ann, uh, leaders like Nivruti Rai at Intel and Rekha Menon at Accenture, uh, Malika Srinivasan at TAFE, and you know all of these other women who really have shown us uh, the path. They have been path breakers, but they are also women who are um, looking around them and saying, how do we help more women to succeed? And Kieran, as a vice chair of the U.S. India Business Council, I think this is an area that we should explore more uh, within USIBC. I am, I am going to take up the challenge that has been laid down today uh, and, and the challenge that the Consul General uh, uh, put before us. And I think um, we will be doing more in this space as we move forward as well. Um, thank you everyone who tuned in for today's uh, very important program and you know keep staying engaged with us and keep bringing us your ideas, um, your initiatives and let's make the US India corridor one that creates opportunity for both countries and for both genders. So let us work together to expand that circle of opportunity. Thanks again very much and look forward to seeing you next week as we talk about the union budget presentation and how we can um, um, think about the year to come from the perspective of the priorities that have been put forward in the prime minister's budget. Once again, have a wonderful week and good day to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.